everybody doing today? Yeah? It's like, uh, I, this is like gotta be one of the best conference venues, right? Because you're just like hanging out on the beach and you're like, okay, maybe we'll go do this. And then it's like, if the talk gets boring, you can just go outside and go <laughs> save, save it on the beach. Yeah, and it's like, you read my mind. Yeah, well, uh, and I, I got the good, the good task of like the post-lunch talk. So hopefully, I, I hope to make this like a real, you know, real smooth, you know, ease into the afternoon. Um, I have had people fall asleep on, at talks before. And I'm just like, I'm sure they're, they're coming from like a really far away time zone. And that's why, you know, that, that's, you got, when you speak, you got to psych yourself up with stuff like that, right? And, and, you know, it's always really good to go home to your wife. She's like, how do people like it? And you're like, uh, yeah, a couple of people fell asleep. Uh, yeah, so uh, anyways, hopefully we won't do that today. Um, if, you, if you do like think you just want to hit the beach or whatever, you can hit me an email. Um, and I have an autoresponder already set up. So it'll like auto give it all to you uh, right now. And so you could just, you know, leave with, uh, with uh, no regrets, you know, at that point and you, you would have it, have it all. So if you send me an uh, email there, it should auto respond. And if you, if you do it and you don't get an auto response right away, like uh, give me a shout and then we'll, I'll check that or whatever. So, uh, okay. So I, I'm down, I'm in from uh, Texas. Uh, I'm from uh, Austin. Uh, I work over at signal sciences. Uh, I think, uh, uh, Signal Sciences has been around. I think we've got a party uh, tonight uh, that should be good if you're interested in, in uh, checking out an after party. Uh, hit me up if you don't know anything about it and you want to come. We'd love to have you. Uh, also, uh, I, I have some courses on DevOps uh, over at lynda.com, also LinkedIn Learning. Uh, and sometimes, and I've been kind of bad about it lately, but uh, me and a couple of buddies, we blog over at the Agile Admin. Um, and, uh, and then a lot of us have put together the courses over at uh, lynda.com. Uh, so I, I kind of thought I'd give you uh, the summary up front too, so we kind of know like where we're going and we kind of see the roadmap for the, the, the path for today. Uh, I think we see that uh, DevOps is changing uh, and there's, there's a big risk. Um, I think that security uh, is in a little bit of a crisis, uh, uh, but I think we have some, some good things coming out. Uh, I, th I see a lot of like forward leaning security shops that have seemed to have found the way. And uh, we're also going to juxtapose some of the old ways and the new ways uh, of security, uh, especially in, in the context of DevOps. Um, okay, so th and I, I've also had like these sort of uh, existential questions on my mind lately. I, I'm, I'm asking like, okay, can security as an industry really rise to the demands of DevOps? Um, and and are we able to like is like is DevOps able to actually handle? all of the cultural baggage that security is bringing to it, right? D um, and w maybe we'll unpack a little bit what that means, but like, I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot of security stereotypes, right? And like, they're, they're there for somewhat of a reason. Uh, and our industry is traditionally kind of uh, a little bit more difficult. Um, and are we, gonna, are we gonna mess up the whole DevOps thing along the way with that? And, uh, you know, and basically I'm like worried, I'm like, this, this DevOps thing has been really beautiful. It's done a lot of really good things and has been built up and is security just gonna come in and like s smash it like they seem to do, we seem to do, right? Uh, um, does that resonate with anybody? Are you guys, does that sound good? I mean, the beach is still <laughs> available, so I don't feel too bad about it. Uh, uh, so uh, my journey, I, I started out working at, uh, right out of college at this big uh, billion dollar uh, company. Uh, we had these brutal on-call rotations. We did these crazy 24 hour uh, go live deployments. Uh, and it was all waterfall, um, and then. Uh, but some of my greatest friends were kind of born in that job, and there was that was the that was the, the place where we came from. Uh, and in '07, I went to a startup, and we were doing stuff in Amazon Cloud. Uh, I learned at that startup a little bit about failure and about what actually makes me happy. Uh, then later, I went back to the that same big company, um, and I uh, yeah, I guess I don't have a slide of that. But then uh, we were just kind of said, all right, hey, like ignore the rest of the company, go cloud, and go all in. And we had a really great time. A lot of us that kind of had lived that old style of those 24-hour painful, you know, deployments and, you know, weekends. It's like uh, we were now were like deploying lots of times per day. We were, you know, not having crazy on call and it was really great. And we sort of saw the um, uh, kind of saw the future. We started, you know, back in 2010, we had a case study written on us and we, as we were doing infrastructure as code. Um, and and we, we kind of did something really neat at this company. We delivered four SaaS products uh, in uh, two years, which was like a really big thing uh, for us back in uh, 10 uh, and 2011. Um, and, and then around that same time, I, I found the rugged software movement. Uh, I live in Austin and I was lucky enough to meet Gene Kim in a bar. And so uh, that, was, uh, that was great. I was, like, I was like, we just read Visible Ops, you know, and that was before Phoenix Project and all the other books he's written. And, uh, and we, you know, we, we uh, had a good time there. 
uh, worked on a, a project, working on a project called Gauntlet, and then later I, I've joined Signal Sciences. But I kind of came to the realization through all this, and, and probably many of y'all have as well, is like in our careers, like what's really important? Like, and I, I think this is one of the things that, that I think sets DevOps apart from a lot of other uh, movements and things we've done in our industry is like our insistence on culture, and we always say uh, DevOps, I, I like the idea of like DevOps is friendship. It really started out with a uh, the idea of having compassion uh, for operations because you know we would start and it would be like okay you'd have ten developers to your one operations person there's this whole throw it over the wall mentality there's that picture of the uh, uh, the developer girl that's got the building on fire it's like it's ops problems now right um, that's that's the that's the that's the that was like our our life in images um, and but we we have seen that labor uh, inequity actually permeates all of the IT or organizations and and security we we live this as well. So for every 100 developers, you would have 10 operations folks to like one security. And these are like order of magnitudes, but does that, do those numbers resonate with anybody? Yeah. Yeah, it was like, yeah, that's that, I'm I'm the one, right? Or or like I'm just a half. Like I'm supposed to like do half half my job is something else, right? And uh, um, and, and so even with all that and and kind of the the baggage that comes with that, I still remain um, pretty optimistic. Um, uh, but then I, uh, and I and I I'm kind of an optimistic type of person. But then uh, earlier this year, I started having some doubts. And uh, my first one was uh, I, I was uh, at RSA. Um, and there was a bus that drove by and it said, you know, DevOps in real big letters. And, and it was for a company that's like very much not DevOps. And I was like, oh, geez, we're just a marketing slogan now, right? And it was sort of like, and so I, cl I claim that as like security being security, right? That's, that's what we do, that's what we, we do, right? It's like, uh, you can rewind like five or seven years ago and it's like cloud, finger quotes, and then, you know, three years later, it's like cloud security, that's what we do. You're like, but nothing has changed, but, you know, just we've, we've just rebranded, right? And that seems like what we do. Um, and then then, er, then later that year, uh, so it's an, I'm not just blaming on security, but I was at the expo floor at Docker, um, and there was a, a booth that said, like, the DevOps tool chain, and it was like, uh, oh, I can't even remember what it was. It was like, put your, you know, you know uh, automation in a Windows box on a VMware and a Docker. I, I, I was like, it's like, that sounds like a nightmare. Like, you don't want to do that. Like, that's something that you're, you're not interested in running uh, uh, all this stuff. Um, and so I sort of felt like, have we, have we allowed this to become a slogan or a gimmick? Um, and, and what really had DevOps uh, become? What, 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 have, what have we kind of built over the years? Um, and if you're new, like, uh, th this is where I started kind of coming to those questions that I posed uh, earlier on. And I, I think back about two of the, the main folks that actually like really helped DevOps get started. So do you guys know who, who these folks are? Uh, nope. Okay, so the guy on the left is uh, Patrick Dubois. He's, uh, he is the guy who coined the word DevOps. Uh, he lives over in Ghent. Um, in uh, 2009, he, uh, uh, him and Andrew Schaefer and some other folks had, had sort of used the words like agile infrastructure or whatever, but then he, he decided to host the first DevOps days. And he was like, we just need a conference where developers and operations can come together and, and meet. Um, the, the guy on the right is uh, John Willis. John R Willis, uh, along with Damon Edwards, uh, they run the, uh, the DevOps uh, Cafe podcast. Uh, but John's uh, done a lot of good stuff. He's worked from Chef to, to Docker. Uh, he's uh, doing a lot of uh, cool stuff now. But... Uh, you know, like a, a lot of the industry, you know, like, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but like, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the communities that kind of arise in like a, in a programming language or a practice area, like they kind of take on like the, 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 uh, however the kind of personality of the main founder. Well, like Patrick is extremely, extremely nice guy. You can tell he's, he's very friendly there. Um, but th that's like one of the things why where DevOps really is always kind of insistent on culture and a lot of push towards that. Um, it's because Patrick really helped us, like, especially in the early days, uh, coming out of the agile stuff saying like, let's, let's build the right culture. Um, and, and that's the big, uh, push behind this. And, you know, and I, I get it. Like I see like in my, in my own story, like, okay, I, I teach DevOps classes and, you know, I work at a, at, a, at a vendor that does kind of some stuff in the DevOps space, in the DevSecOps space. Um, I help write articles about DevOps and security at Signal Sciences. Um, but it, it really helped me start thinking about this as I was kind of, kind of having these uh, existential doubts and this, this idea of like, what, what am I really doing here? Is to sort of go back to what Patrick said all the way. And this, I think this quote came from Patrick back in uh, uh, probably 2010 or 2011. He, he was kind of posed with the challenge of like DevOps is great because like a lot of startups can do it. I mean, if you're like, if you've got 20 people, like 
sure, fine, everybody's like one happy family team, but it's not going to work in the enterprise setting. And he said, you know, culture is the most important aspect to DevOps succeeding in the enterprise. And, um, and I think when we kind of rewind, rewind and really think about it, what, what is it we're doing, uh, and we kind of get stuck thinking about tool chains and all this other automation and others, all this other business, um, we kind of lose, uh, lose kind of the focus of what we're, what we're actually trying to accomplish and, you know, what DevOps has already accomplished uh, so far. I, I think about this uh, personally in my family. Uh, I uh, I like to to say that we have a moon culture in my family. Uh, we're not. It's not like uh, it's not quite as mystic as you might think. But uh, when my daughter was like two or three, she's five now. Um, my oldest is five, and and she. Uh, she would always say like, "Oh, the the moon's out tonight." She really like was really excited about seeing the moon, and I started realizing like. Uh, something in me started to shift, right? Like I got excited when I saw the moon. Uh, I started downloading apps to like figure out the phases of the moon. Uh, and I could like tell her like, yeah, honey, it's like a waxing crescent moon tonight or whatever, right? You know, I could be like, oh yeah, it's like, that's oh, going to rise up over this way or, you know, whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, so I started thinking that like, I, I started having, uh, and, it, and it hit me one day on my drive home and I saw, you know, the moon and I call my wife. I'm like, you got to get Lydia outside. Cause like, it is like really, you know, big and, and, uh, um, and, uh, it, it was great. But I, I realized like I was actually starting to change like my own personal, uh, desires and my personal opinion. And like, I developed this new understanding. I had a shared language, shared views and, um, and then I was even putting the, like those apps on my phone, right, to have the, the tooling. So I started thinking back, and this is our original team that kind of put this together. Um, and I've given a version of this talk to, um, I, I should also preface the whole thing with, I, I've given, I've only given this talk like a couple times, but um, mostly to DevOps audiences, because I'm, I'm trying to be like, hey, how, do, how are security people actually going to move forward? So this is, I'm kind of hoping that like, uh, th that we as security people agree and we can kind of like, you know, deliver on some of the promises I've made to these very kind DevOps people. Uh, that was a joke. So <laughs> there, that's where they'll, there'll be more of those. Uh, I'll try to cue you next time. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, Anyway, so I hope you can make a connection and make, make a friend through your journey uh, today. Okay, so let, let's go back to our, our main, um, uh, our main uh, point here is like, I think security is in crisis. So um, there's a, a great book, uh, uh, Steve Beloven, he wrote the uh, firewall book, uh, like that was like the book on firewalls in the, the late 90s. But recently uh, he released a book uh, called Thinking Security. He says, uh, companies are spending a great deal on security, but we read of massive computer related attacks and something is wrong and the problem is twofold. We're protecting the wrong things and we're hurting productivity in the process. So uh, I, I think we can see that like there is, there is a, uh, there is a problem. Does this resonate with anybody? Does you feel like security kind of, this is the, this hits, okay. Um, good, I'm glad, uh, you know, sometimes it's like that, that one doesn't even get a laugh. I'm like, oh geez, we're in, you're in for it. If you, that one's not funny to you. All right, so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, th there's a great book uh, on browser security called The Tangled Web. Uh, but in the, the first chapter, uh, there's, a, there's kind of a walkthrough of how the security industry and where it's been and, and been going over the, the last uh, uh, 30, 40 years. But in it, it says, security by risk assessment introduces a dangerous fallacy that structured inadequacy is almost as good as adequacy, and that underfunded security effort plus risk management are about as good as properly funded security work. Um, does, that, does that bother you? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The, um, w you know what? What, is, what are they saying here, right? So they're saying uh, by doing risk assessment uh, that we don't actually have to do engineering. We can be actuarial, do actuarial stuff, and buy insurance policies, um, and that we we don't actually have to fund it anymore, um, and that th that we can just say, hey, like it's adequate, it's good enough. Stop an insurance policy on top of it, right? Do, do now, does that does that bother you, right? And, and I read that, and, and kind of through this that first chapter, he kind of walks through uh, how um, uh, you know over the over the years how like we, we used to spend a lot of money and time and in, you know on engineering stuff, and then over the years we kind of got compliance, we got these insurance policy things, and we st stopped doing a lot of like actual engineering work, and we started doing uh, more as more like this. Uh, often I see that security is the uh, cultural. Uh, outlier. Um, this is a book that came out last October uh, called Agile Application Security. They say that many security teams work with a worldview where their goal is to inhibit change as much as possible. Does anybody have a friend who experiences that? Right. Um, and and I, I've experienced this personally. I have like uh, 
Uh, I've had a, a developer friend tell me this. Uh, I was kind of working as a security guy on the kind of in the DevOps team, and they were saying, uh, you know, you guys just prefer to have a system unplugged and powered off. And I was like, well, I mean, I'm not an idiot. Like, we got to make money. <laughs> like, I was like, I, you know, that, you know, but it's sort of like that's to their, their point of view is like, that we are so disconnected from reality as an industry that like we we would just rather have all the all the computers turned off. And then I hear a lot of security folks say this like those stupid developers, right? It's like oh you you got you know some sort of injection or some cross site script or whatever problem with your page like you must be stupid, right? Like one small flaw equals like. Uh, you know, a character assessment of a person, right? And and we hear hear that kind of cascade through uh, our industry as well. And uh, uh, a, a leading security industry uh, industry publication recently sent uh, me this in a in a flyer, and it says, "Hey, it's 30 times cheaper to fix security defects in in uh, dev versus prod." So we've known this, um, but the, the sad part is we've known this since 2002, and uh, and I got it on a flyer like I'm not joking on a flyer last year, right? So like uh, in 2017. So that's like. Uh, pretty disconnected uh, from reality. So um, I actually tried the MapQuest joke with my father-in-law the other day, and he was like, yeah, MapQuest. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> okay, so uh, hopefully he doesn't watch this video recording. I'm sure he won't. Okay, so uh, uh, anyways, I, I think that the premise is like security's in crisis. Um, we must change or we must die. Um, so I work at Signal Sciences. We provide kind of a WAF-like type product. Uh, when, I when I first started, I was like, oh, I'm going to research. Certainly, like, there's cool stuff out there, whatever going on. And, and th there's, this is just to show, like, the disconnection uh, of uh, the research here. Uh, but one, of one, one WAF provider says something like, every, every aspect of managing this is an ongoing process, blah, blah, blah. And you got to go in with everyone's eyes open and effort required to get and keep the WAF running productively. And they go on to say you need like two headcount. And I'm like, in an industry like where we don't have enough people to fill all the recs that are open, and like you are not going to get two headcount to do that. Like we, you don't even have, you have half a headcount at best, you know, for anything, right? Um, and so it's just very disconnected. Uh, Rich Mogul also says that uh, we need to change or die. Um, or that we are going to do it. Uh, he was talking about, he was looking at the RSA floor and said a lot of people that are here now, they're not going to be here in five years. Um, uh, th there's another, so the business is also saying that we need to change or die. Uh, this is uh, from Fortune magazine, uh, I guess about a year, year and a half ago. Uh, well, I guess almost two years now, time flies. Uh, but it says the average time to deliver corporate IT projects is uh, eight and a half months. Um, and it's, it's risen from eight and a half months to over 10 months in the last five years. Uh, but why is that? And it goes on to say it's the growth of security functions, which are too poorly coordinated. And they often ar arise from doing stuff like compliance, privacy, and data protection, and all the legal stuff that we're doing. So again, not actual functional engineering work, but just like more you know, tasks and, and compliance driven type stuff. Um, and you're probably like, okay, I think we've got the point, right? But um, I think that we, we just live in this world where uh, security folks are, are having a hard time keeping up. And now that we've kind of shifted in this like post or post waterfall and like an agile or DevOps uh, uh, place where we're able to not uh, keep up with, uh, uh, with everything that's going on. And, and, and a long time ago, or like I guess seven, eight years ago, uh, there was the uh, rugged software development movement. Uh, I liked it at, at the time, and I still think there's a lot of value here. And just thinking about how in security, we always think about absence of events. Uh, we have costs. It's negative. Uh, we have a lot of uh, fear, uncertainty, doubt that we use to kind of promote that. But in the, the rugged uh, sense, like we try to verify quality, there's a, there's a value uh, po uh, proposition here. Uh, it's often pretty affirming. And, uh, and, and even just, uh, I guess, like in November, uh, John Willis, who I mentioned earlier, he's like, security didn't really get an invite to the DevOps party. So he actually was, was saying it from a sense of like, hey, DevOps people, like we did this wrong. Like we, we, we pulled in, the, we fixed the 10 to 1 Dev to Ops, but we didn't fix the rest of the problem. Like we still have this divide. So it's not, um, it's, you know, the blame doesn't purely sit on the security side. Um, and, and he goes on to say like, uh, you know, read-only containers and serverless shift the security story to almost 100% application security, and we're shifting everything around. I think that also really spells uh, a lot more future for uh, OWASP and, and kind of our application security uh, space that we're in as well. Okay, so I think, uh, I think so DevOps, and the kind of what we'll say is that we think DevOps is the way for security really to survive here. Uh, the state of DevOps report says that you know people spend a lot less money whenever they're on, on security, whenever they're, uh, uh, when they're doing DevOps right. And that uh, high-performing orgs uh, 
achieve quality by incorporating security uh, and security teams into the delivery process. Uh, here's, a, here's a talk on this if you're interested. Uh, you can get the, the link from the slides. But I, I'd like to... Um, I like to propose like what I think is like our new path and we're going to juxtapose kind of uh, old path and new path and kind of see if there's some ways forward and this maybe will give you some ideas um, and I'd love to hear if you have any other ideas of things that are that are going on because I mean part of the idea is here like uh, you know DevOps has done a lot of really great things uh, securities in crisis some people have already picked up on this and some people are already kind of leaning into this and doing some really cool things. And I think we're now sort of like accumulating a long enough list of new things that we're doing that we weren't doing as a security industry five, uh, five seven years ago. Then now we can start, of start looking at this new list and say, hey, like we, we actually have something here. And like this is something that we think is worthwhile and this is something that we um, add as a value uh, creation or, or value to the business as we're kind of moving forward. So uh, let's, we'll, we'll go through them one by one. Um, and our first one here was say, like the old way was like we like to embrace security or secrecy. <coughs> and the uh, new way is to create feedback loops. So uh, Rich Smith, uh, former uh, security director over at Etsy, uh, he also helped write that uh, Agile uh, application security book. Uh, he says a security team who embraces openness about what it does and why uh, spreads understanding. So the idea is creating runtime loops for uh, runtime feedback loops. And so you want to look at uh, parts of your site where you can say, all right, like, are people trying to take over, like, certain accounts for my users? Uh, what part of my site is actually under attack? Uh, what kind of vectors do people normally attack? Um, like, like, these are sort of basics. These are like, there's kind of like, uh, I hate to use sports analogies, but like, uh, like tackling and blocking, right? It's like, are, do, you, do you know where, where the attacks are coming from? And, you know, are, there, are they being successful or not, right? Kind of, like, kind of basic kind of stuff. Oh yeah, this is my this is this is uh, the only uh, gift I got in here, I think. Um, but but being able to answer that question of like, are you under attack? Do you feel like right now you can answer that question pretty well, right? Like, no, we can't, right? We don't even have like that like kind of that simple feedback loop uh, in our industry. Uh, and then then the where, you know, we would really like to hope to know that as well. Uh, Okay, so uh, Zane, who is uh, uh, the CISO for and founder for uh, Signal Sciences, uh, he does this nice little thing. Like we used to, we used to do this, and kind of like this isn't horrible. This is a feedback loop, right? Like having logs and like emitting kind of events and stuff like that. But then it's better if you can actually put visualization in in front of folks uh, as well for like what kind of attacks are actually happening, what kind of anomalies. Um, and part of, uh, part of the story for us was, you know, Zane built that over at, at uh, Etsy, and then now we launched into Signal Sciences. And, and just putting some sort of instrumentation in place, whether it's a RASP or uh, uh, Next Generation WAF or, or whatever you want to put in there, but like put some sort of feedback and telemetry back from, uh, from runtime. Uh, I, I liked this, uh, John Alspa, who uh, he was, uh, he was uh, leading uh, engineering over at uh, Etsy, but at the time he was leading Flickr. But at the time of Rise of DevOps, if you don't know who John Alspa is, uh, he, the, he did the, the talk that was like, that is the talk that everybody thinks about when they think of DevOps. And it was called like doing 10 deploys a day. And, uh, and everybody at the time in 2009, they're like, we do four deploys a year and we, we pray that there's not any more than that, right? And so, like, why would you do 10 deploys a day? Um, but he's, he's kind of been talking recently, like, we, uh, and, and kind of really getting into more, like, how we're working with incidents and, uh, and helping operations folks think differently about how we think about incidents. And I think it's also, this applies over to, and crosses the chasm over into security as well. Like, everything, all security incidents, even, you know, Equifax or whatever, like, they could actually be worse, um, and so at the surface, like we want to ask these types of questions, like what went wrong? How did it break? How do we fix it? But we actually need to get to this deeper level of understanding um, of what are the things that went into making it not as bad as it could have been? Um, what, what types of stuff did we do right? You know, and like that helps you kind of juxtapose the two in your mind as you're kind of doing this incident resolution. It helps you also not stop doing the good stuff that you've, that you've been doing. So having instrumentation in place, like at least to be able to answer these level of questions, like that's really helpful. Okay, so uh, the next one uh, we'll, we'll zip through, but like, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I should have said it. So the old way was like just pass audit, right? The new way we're going to say is compliance adds value. Um, 
policies and procedures, uh, you know, that's what, that's what auditors live and die for. Uh, and having effective execution of those is what, you know, lets the business keep running. Um, but a lot of times we don't understand that. We sort of just sort of put it like an us versus them scenario. And, you know, I don't know, like most of the PCI and all the frameworks, I mean, yeah, they're, they're actually not horrible if you can remove all the waterfall bits. So you just got to figure out like how to work with your, your auditors uh, on undoing that. Um, and you really want to get to this point where you're treating deploys as standard or routine changes that they've been pre-approved by management and don't require a heavyweight uh, change review meeting or anything like that. And, uh, and I like to think of like separation of duties that is considered harmful, you know. Uh, you know, it's like a lot of times we treat our software like we're like launching a nuke. And uh, I think when I first found this, we weren't in like a nuclear war scenario. So it was like more funny, you know, and now it's like, ah. Uh, I hope I hope that works. Uh, so, <laughs> um, but you know, we 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 kind of treat it like this thing that's like a really uh, um, uh, you know a big thing. But but if we read like s even something like simple like PCI six four two, it says, hey, it's not it's not like the same person can't do it. It's like you can't use the same account to do it, right? And like auditors have been dealing with this for a while. Um, yeah. So basically, you just need you just need to work on putting in independent checkpoints in place. Uh, if you need uh, some resources on this, like here's uh, here's one, and I think I got another link here. So some sometimes I just like try to add slides in here that I think might be helpful for folks. So that's that's kind of what I'm doing here. Um, but there's the DevOps Audit Defense Toolkit. So if you find yourself like fighting the DevOps battle and you need to fight the auditors on it, like this is a good place to start. Um, and so hopefully that's uh, helpful for you. All right, so oh, so old way is uh, enforce stability, and a new way was create chaos. Uh, everybody's familiar with uh, Netflix's Chaos Monkey, right? Right. W why why did like a hundred lines of shell script like capture the heart and mind of our industry? Why, right? It's because they said we are going to uh, apply actual chaos to our system, and we're going to try to break stuff. And everybody's like, that is genius, right? And um, and and it, we we've sort of seen a movement like this where. People are doing their own chaos monkeys, a lot of variation there. Uh, there's the anti-fragile book. Uh, Release it just came out with its uh, second edition and there's a whole chapter on uh, chaos engineering. Uh, this is Michael Nygaard's book. I think I have a link to it. Uh, my buddy Aaron, Aaron Reinhardt is uh, working on uh, a project called Chaos Slinger, uh, if you're interested in doing that, but they're doing chaos experiments. Um, it adds misconfiguration to your stack, checks to see if it gets uh, uh, detected. Um, it runs in a, as a Lambda and serverless. But, uh, you know, th part of the idea here is, like, we're trying to validate our system and make sure that it can handle chaos, uh, and we do this through chaos experiments. Uh, and, uh, and, and I like to, in Nygaard's book, he sort of, like, really brings it all home for you if you're, if you're trying to think about this and how to do it in your organization. But building, like, a culture where, like, you have to opt out of the chaos and, like, your management team's always saying, like, okay, like, well, how come, like, you, is your stuff not hardened, you know, like, hardened enough to, like, actually survive, like, you know, the chaos monkey, why not, right? And they, 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 they kind of build a culture of it. So it, it actually is more of a cultural thing than a technology thing, right? Because like deleting some servers or turning stuff off, like that's really not that, uh, that hard of a thing. Uh, and I'd recommend that book, uh, Release It's a really great, uh, great book. Uh, also, you know, I think another thing that we think about uh, creating chaos, like I think bug bounties are another good example of that, another, another way to do it. Uh, I have a friend who's uh, not really in security at all, but he's like, oh yeah, we get pen tested all the time. And he's like, he, he told me like, he's like, he's really proud about it. And I thought, you know, um, bug bounties again, right? Like it's, it's more of a systemization of a thing that we've been doing for a really long time, but like it is a shift and it is a shift that, that has crossed out of just like security pen testing and kind of like a smaller domain knowledge to like the wider development audience in general. And I think that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, okay. Uh, old path, build a wall, uh, new path, zero trust networks. So I do like the new OSI model. <laughs> I, I actually can memorize this one. I feel good about this. Um, and uh, and I, 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 I like it. Uh, and I think that we see like the, our, uh, our ACLs have moved off the network over to the application layer. Um, and we see that we're no longer thinking, uh, yeah, I mean, we still do it at some, but like as, as a whole, like we've kind of shifted into this idea like, okay, there is no perimeter. Don't, you know, don't have anything like that. Uh, we're going to assume compromise at all layers. We're going to uh, instrument everything that we can. And we're going to control our endpoints uh, and all the way to our customer accounts and just sort of, you know, instrument as much as we possibly can. Um, I help run the uh, Modern Security Series, and uh, uh, we have Wendy Nather joining us uh, from Duo Security uh, this Thursday, so in, in uh, two days. And uh, if you can check it out, like, it's a good, like, post-conference uh, uh, event. Maybe you can uh, 
come come join us and it should be a really good time uh, I really uh, enjoy uh, just hearing Windy talk about anything so like it's going to be even better now we're talking about uh, uh, zero trust networks Okay, uh, next, uh, slow validation versus fast and non-blocking. So uh, I think we, uh, we had fast and non, like, like when we think about fast and non-blocking, like what do we really mean? Like we're saying don't slow down delivery, still do continuous testing, um, but you don't always have to be like in the middle of the pipeline. You don't have to be like a, you know, it, it, pa it doesn't pass, so like I'm going to go ahead and break the build. Um, and maybe doing penetration testing on the outside or like in a sidecar fashion. Uh, at Signal Sciences, we do about 10, 15 deploys per day. Uh, we've done roughly 10,000 deploys in the last two and a half years. Um, and when we first started, like, uh, I, I pulled off uh, Jez Humble's book on continuous delivery. And uh, Jez is an, uh, he's a former uh, ThoughtWorks uh, uh, guy. And I said, all right, that's like, how, do, how am I going to, uh, thanks, uh, uh, how, how are we going to do this? Like, how are we going to build this in a, in a pipeline way? And so if you're, if you find yourself like needing to build a pipeline or need some like best practices, like I, I really, uh, enjoyed this book. Um, and Jez talks about it now. He's like, I don't know. It's kind of a dry book. I don't know how it's done so well or people really liked it, but it, it's really, really helpful. So, uh, and one of the things that he talks about in the book is like, how little can you deploy at a time? Like how long does it take you, uh, your total cycle time from, you know, checking in uh, one, one small line code commit to, uh, to have it running. Um, and this is something that we really have kind of uh, obsessed about over at Signal Sciences. Like we optimize for total cycle time. And that was, that's that time from code commit to running in production. Uh, we built a deploy system and let everybody uh, run it and everybody has the access to push their own thing. We have a culture that says like if you write it, you must deploy it. Uh, you must make sure and support it in production. Um, you know, all these things are like cultural type stuff. They're not just, you know, a, uh, uh, they're not just a, uh, a push to say like, oh, let's just add new tech for, for the sake of doing that. Uh, we're also a, uh, a, a security company, so like we couldn't just do this without uh, putting security into it. So we put security as part of our CI/CD pipeline, and we mo mostly focus. So if you look at the five phases, or some people call it, you know, six or whatever, but you look at these these three phases. These are where I like to think about uh, where we can put some security in our pipeline. So what have I bundled into my app that leaves me vulnerable? So all of the, the libraries and other stuff and all the junk that I've inherited. Um, when, whenever I run and do my build and acceptance tests uh, and integration tests, carry any, catch any security issues before release, and then in operation, you you want to say, like, am I you know, that same question I was asking earlier? Like, am I being attacked now? Is it working? Um, but I like to think through uh, those steps. Um, the other two steps are also very you know important as well. But these are kind of where I've I've kind of put all of our uh, our effort in focusing on. Uh, so then, uh, so lastly, we ha or another one we have is certainty testing versus adversity testing. And uh, old way was, uh, or the new way I say is like be mean to your code. And so in this, uh, the book Agile Application Security, they say the goal should be to come up with a set of automated tests uh, that probe and check security configurations and runtime system behavior for security features that will execute every time the system is built and every time it is deployed. This is kind of our, our standard of what we're trying to do. But security tools are like kind of noisy, they're difficult to use. Uh, we needed a way to like collaborate between developers and operations security. Um, we needed a way to span, uh, you know, across these across these groups that would make sense to folks. Uh, so I worked on. I've been working on a project called Gauntlet, and uh, but there's other stuff like uh, 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 security BDD or like just using the robot framework or, or other types of testing. Um, but this comes with pre-canned hooks. Uh, it it uh, doesn't install any tools, but fits in your CI/CD pipeline. Uh, you can check it out at gauntlet.org. And our really stunning graphics are, you know, uh, running these uh, tests and, uh, and it passes out the back. It looks for anything called an attack file in kind of a plain English uh, scenario. Uh, I, you can get it from the gym, but I really I prefer to like run in a Docker container, which I have a link for that uh, next. But it's, it's real simple of like, what am I trying to test? Uh, given I have this, this setup here, uh, and I run this this test, then I expect the output to be this. And you, this is a very simple thing that you can put in like a Travis uh, or Jenkins or whatever, and run uh, with your uh, with your site. Uh, 
Uh, Aaron Reinhardt over at United Healthcare, he says, yeah, hey, we use Gauntlet and we've uh, used it a lot. And, uh, and he said, it saved millions of dollars. I was like, well, how do I get any of those millions of dollars? That'd be really great, Aaron. <laughs> so uh, he's, he was just sort of being uh, pretty excited about it. But um, th kind of that was our original hope, like really to build something that would help folks, uh, um, both whether you're in security or, or uh, development or operations, to kind of build this uh, uh, kind of plain text thing. So Matt Johansson and I did a talk on this. Um, and the workshop has some labs for Gauntlet. And if you want the links, like they're all, they're all in there as well. Uh, okay, I, and I have some like some demo stuff. We'll kind of skip through this because we're kind of run a little lower on time. Um, and I sh we also have a way how to set it up inside of a CD uh, system. And I really prefer to use it in a Docker container, and you can get that over at Gauntlet uh, dash Docker. So you can put uh, the tool with all the or the the Gauntlet with all the other tools that you have uh, inside of the container, and just execute it straight out of that. Okay, so uh, another thing that we, we like to do is in security, we would always just like say, oh, we're going to do our testing when we're done. And that's a real waterfall type approach. But the new way is to uh, shift left. I like Shannon Leitz's, uh, you probably have noticed by now, I just, I find a bunch of things that I like and I just assemble them all into a, uh, a deck. And so, um, uh, sorry, uh, sorry that I do that, but uh, that's kind of, kind of the way, uh, big bar on steel, I guess. But uh she talks about a, a software supply chain, a secure software supply chain, and thinking about where we have all these these phases, and then the questions to ask. Uh, notice she has four phases for for her pipeline. Um, but thinking through, like, uh, okay, well, in design, like, how am I adding security in build? Like, are, are the components do they have the right security applied to them uh, for deployment? How am I securing secrets and managing my config management system or operation? Is my app getting attacked? But thinking through these different phases and kind of breaking this down, like, I think that's a real helpful approach. Uh, and and even stuff like the culture at Intuit is really cool because they're like, oh, we're gonna do we're gonna do. Um, uh, red team Mondays, and so uh, the security team just gets around a big conference room and like tries to attack the uh, uh, the sites in different parts of the system, and uh, and it, and it's made a culture where like people will come and say, hey, uh, you know, we're making some changes to our application next week. Can you can you guys put us on your your red team Monday list and you know go up the list? Um, and and again, that's like, it's one of those things like as a security person, like crossing the chasm into uh, into uh, developers and operations people, like people that we were really uh, uh, kind of like separate silos from for such a long time. Now they're kind of engaging security and excited about it, and through through stuff like this. And and uh, I think that this has the power to kind of uh, be as cultural so culturally significant as like Chaos Monkey ha has or was, you know, several years ago. Uh, you know, and and I think. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes we think like, well, okay, I don't have to worry too much about my testing far left because, you know, inheritance and all that stuff in containers and it's all, you know, isolated or whatever. But like uh, Gareth Rushgrove has a talk on like what's inside that container and, you know, like uh, g a good chunk of containers have vulnerabilities built. Surprise, surprise. I know none of us in here are surprised by it. Um, but like just continuing to think through that whole pipeline and like how to, how to break that up is really helpful for, for us. Uh, the last one, you know, we used to take a real process-driven approach, um, and uh, Jason Chan over at Netflix, he, he uses the words the paved road, which I think is really helpful. Uh, it's making making it easy for people to do the right thing. Um, you know, whether it's like using gold images or having blessed builds and dependencies or saying like, if you kind of go with the standard processes, like you're going to get security by default. Um, again, like I, I think these are each of these areas, like I've just seen like our, uh, our evidences of how like, as a, as an org as a industry, like security has shifted, and, and I'm pretty excited about that, and that's why I still remain uh, pretty optimistic. So uh, I guess in the end, like my last charter is like, hey, let's not be let's not be blockers, but let's be enablers of the business, uh, and I think that's that's it. So if you send me an email, there's the slides, and we can have time for questions if if y'all want. So thanks.